Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm very pleased to have Philip Kotler here, live from the US, and to be interviewing him on the topic of entrepreneurial marketing. Hello, Philip Kotler. Hello, Julia. It's nice to uh, get together to talk about one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> Great. So Philip Kotler is probably the most well-known marketer around the world. He has lectured for over 40 years and has received 22 honorary degrees for his pioneering work. He has published over 90 books so far, and one of which was earlier this year on the topic of entrepreneurial marketing, which is today's interview topic. And my name is Julia Schlader. I've been working in international marketing and sales for over 12 years, and I own my own growth marketing business and coaching business called Circular Growth which makes me very excited about uh, today's interview because uh, we as business owners can learn a lot from Philip Kotler. So uh, there will be uh, the opportunity to ask questions. Please use the live chat throughout this interview and I will read the questions out to Philip Kotler towards the end of today's interview. Also, Philip Kotler has prepared a few slides, which I will show whenever you want uh, to show them. So let's start with the first question. Uh, Philip Kotler, for those of the viewers who haven't read the book, Entrepreneurial Marketing, how would you summarize the main points? And I think we can actually show the, show the first slide as well. Yes. Well, here's my answer to uh, the question. Uh, I've written a lot of things uh, in marketing but I'm very excited now about my latest book called Entrepreneurial Marketing. Now, it's a contrast to what we call professional marketing. And we are not putting down professional marketing at all. In fact, the whole world works on professional marketing. But the idea is that the professional marketers work very hard to achieve their goals and missions in other words, to sell everything they can. And they're so busy doing that, they may not be able to find time to think outside of the box of just selling, selling, and selling. So we need another level of marketing uh, consisting of people who have the time to think more broadly about where are we going as a business? What expansions can we do into adjacent markets, what new values and features can we offer? Now, remember, the professional markets are so busy making sure they reach their quotas at the given prices that they're not with the time to think about it. So we need to have two layers. Uh, and I'm going to want to show you what these two layers are if you have the next slide. Wonderful. The, the two layers or clusters are the following. Um, if you look at the top one, it has to, it's a description of what it is to be entrepreneurial, basically. In other words, people who are entrepreneurial, they start having a lot of ideas. So it begins with C or creativity. And of, of all those ideas, one or two might really strike them or strike the company as something to develop further. And the one that was selected is called the innovation we're working on now. Now, for that innovation to work, it must have entrepreneurial support from the leader. So the entrepreneurial attitude, E, and a leader who believes in it is going to make it possible to produce, hopefully, a very useful and profitable innovation. Meanwhile, while that's going on, the company is performing as normal. And that is captured in the second cluster uh, that starts with the idea that there's a lot of productive people. There's a lot of the organization from day to day is being productive. And not only that, uh, many of the people see improvements in what they're doing to sell more goods and services. And that's nice. Now, improvements are not the same as innovations. They're just making things 
move a little more efficiently. And they're doing it very professionally. And um, money is coming in. And, and all the work of achieving the goals is being carried out by managers, many managers under the leader, of course. Now, so all of that is descriptive. Now, it is possible to imagine a company that is only with that second level, PIPM. In other words, it will be performing very well. However, the world is changing so rapidly that a company cannot plan to be around five years from now without adapting to all the new changes that are occurring. And we're finding many companies do not change. They don't have, they think that they're successful and therefore there's nothing to change. So we think they're going to be facing a real extinction as a company. And we're offering the idea that to survive, they must have both of these operations going on, namely a operation of creativity that leads to new ideas and adaptations and 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 the performance now that's not enough you'll notice four different things surrounding what will become the overall model namely marketing work has to be very effective and we always uh, recognize that one of the other senior officers gets very concerned about marketing and whether it is effective, and that's finance. So if you go from the upper left to the lower right, there's always a, a issue between uh, the two. And the finance person may say, what was the contribution of marketing? What was marketing's ROI, return on investment? Well, uh, marketing may say, uh, here it is. And finance may say, well, we gave you a lot more money. We expected much more uh, achievement than you're showing, basically. And I can't give you as much money as we've been doing it before. Now, the one, first thing I've always noticed about a company that is failing, they, the head of marketing and the head of finance have not worked together to produce a uh, a cooperation to do the best for the company. And later on during our talk, I'm going to show you a wonderful example of where a company recognized that problem and created a wonderful working relationship between marketing and finance. Now, the other uh, thing you'll notice is technology at the lower left, which is so rapidly growing uh, and companies have to think, oh, here's a new technology, uh, the digital dollar, uh, the uh, uh, a AI, generative AI, or called sometimes uh, uh, AI GPT. What are we going to do with that? What are we going to do with robots? What are we? So technology comes about, and all of the company is going to think about it. And the real question is, what is that technology going to do for humanity in the end? Uh, that's why we should look at the lower left and its impact on the upper right, humanity. Is it possible that we will develop um, robots that will make decisions for us, even better decisions, and independently become a force that doesn't need us anymore, as the science fiction people talk about robots getting consciousness but that's, we're not thinking that's going to happen at all or soon. But the main thing is uh, we know that technology can set humanity back or forward. Let's say technology comes along, which hurts our environment. It hurts our quality of water and air. Uh, and that's been bad for humanity. Or can we find technology that makes our air and water better and our soil better? So the effects of technology always have to, of new technologies have to be looked at. All right. Now, Perfect. the point I want to make is just from that, the questions that come from this model of thinking is, well, one would be, 
Um, are you saying that a company should continue to have its full marketing group, but add a few more people, maybe just a few who are entrepreneurial and freer to think more broadly about new ideas? Uh, and are they to be under the same chief marketing officer? Um, and how many such people should be entrepreneurial in the organization of marketing compared to the big staff of marketers? So Thanks. we don't have Sorry real for answers for that. Um, you touched a lot of different topics and we'll actually go into much more detail later on. And uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your insights so far. Um, let's actually continue with another model. I know you've prepared another slide um, about the so-called omni-house model. Yes, yes. It's used to explain this holistic perspective of entrepreneurial marketing, which you recommend in your book. So, yes, we think that this is the yeah. real contribution. And already you know about the two uh, horizontal clusters. I, that, that's why I, I talked about it. But there's more things, too. Uh, for example, um, look, look at the thing that's called the dynamics. Uh, that is in the upper left, dynamics. Now, what does it mean, 5D into 4C? Well, it's five drivers that every company must pay attention to. Uh, because they're going to affect every company in the world. What are the drivers? Well, they've already been mentioned to some extent. One of them is technology change. Another one is political and legal changes. A third is economic changes. A fourth is social, cultural changes. And the fifth is uh, just changes in the marketplace. Now, those drivers are turned into the impact they're going to have on the four C's. Well, what are the four C's? They are the company you work for, the company, the competition you're facing, that would be the second C. The third one would be uh, your, uh, uh, would be the, uh, the channels of distribution that you have to work with to reach the customers. And the fourth one would be changes of all kinds happening in marketing. So we start with these dynamics of big um, drivers impacting our company and our competitors. So we move from there to the next triangle at the top right, uh, which is called competitiveness, uh, because we want comp a competitive positioning to occur through the drivers and our and and their their impact on the four C's. So you'll notice something called PDP, and what that is, an abbreviation of the idea of positioning, differentiation, and branding. Namely, if we're going to be competitive, we're going to know how we are positioned. In other words. Who are we making things for? What market are we positioning ourselves in? And that's the P, but then the D is, are we different than our competitors? If we're not different at all, we have a real problem. So what can we do from going from P, our positioning, to a differentiated uh, way of being in that market against our competitors? And the answer is, the B, which is the branding. Namely, we can be different in many ways, but the basic thing is our brand should have a different weight in the minds of customers than the other uh, ones we're competing with. If we succeed with positioning and differentiation and branding, which is the PDP, we have nine things to work with. Now that's called 9E. Now that's very interesting because in, in the old days, we used to talk about marketing being the four Ps. Set your pride product, set your prices, set your promotion, and, and set your, your place or your distribution. Okay, now we're, we're going from four Ps to a whole marketing plan consisting of five, of nine elements. So that's what 9E means. I'll just mention, uh, very briefly, because it's in the book. You know all of those elements. 
their segmentation, their targeting, their um, uh, selling, their service, their processes. You have to go to the book to see what these nine tools are in our, what we call our marketing mix. Okay. So notice this Omni House brings in, it reminds all the marketers of so many things to consider. Let's, as a matter of fact, go down to the bottom tri left triangle, which is says B slash S leads to I slash S. I can explain that very easily. B slash S is balance sheet. All of your work in, in this company today will reflect on a balance sheet, and then the IS is an income statement. And that's the past. You, you hope you did a beautiful job with your balance sheet and your income statement, but you're moving into the future. And in moving into the future, you're moving into CF and MV. And what is that? See, you've got to plan on your cash flow for developing your future business. You better have a big enough cash flow because your aim is to increase your MV, your market value. Wow. There's not anything left out of this model. Now, what is important about it is every marketer is in part of the system somewhere and will think maybe about two or three things, but the entrepreneurial idea is to be thinking in terms of the impact of your plan on everything that will be important. So Julia, that's that, that summarizes a lot about one model. It mostly does. Thank you so much for the insights on this holistic perspective. And I'd like to um, choose one of the driving forces, the competitiveness. And uh, you mentioned that we actually need to rethink competition. So what advice can you give to companies? How can they balance like competition and collaboration with others from a more sustainable viewpoint? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, we always think we only can be competitive. And the fact is that uh, there's a lot of partners we might want help from. Uh, or very often, general, uh, let's take Procter & Gamble. They will um, say, um, we got to uh, have some other, we may have to take over some companies that have skill sets that we don't have and that we badly need. Or they may not be wanting to be taken over, but maybe we can work with them. Uh, and uh, do joint work together uh, as partners. Uh, that that should always be possible. And by the way, I sometimes uh, bring in a third thing where sometimes government uh, is doing something that we're also interested in, and we should always think of possible private and public partnerships too. Uh, especially the big problems of a country are often in, uh, faced by the government and the government wants to work with private industry uh, 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 companies to make and put them together to get a joint collaboration going. Now, there's another thing that's important to talk about. Is your company going to be a market driven company? or a market driving company. And it has a lot to do with um, your view of, uh, of other companies. Uh, a market driven company says, we know we've already chosen the needs that we want to satisfy and the people who have those needs. So all, our, uh, we're, expect all we're expected to do is um, produce satisfaction or even delight on the part of our target market. We're not uh, market driving, we're market driven. But, uh, you know, you could be a market driving company, a one that uh, actually goes beyond the existing needs of your customers and imagines ways to make them better off. Now, that's courageous. That's entrepreneurial. When you're saying, boy, Maybe uh, our customers uh, may want us to, um, let's say we were in the, back in time when we had horses. 
uh, our customers are always telling us, uh, can you get help me get my horse to be faster? And the answer, if you're a market driving company, is you shouldn't have a horse, you should have a car. Uh, so, And they never thought of that. So a market driving company often comes up with ideas that may be resisted initially by the industry, but frankly, they're the company's trying to say, I want to go beyond your needs into your benefits, your potential level of being. I can help that too. I can make your lives better in a way you never realized. That's a great attitude of a market driving company. Thank you so much. So um, when we think of entrepreneurs and um What would, and you also mentioned that in your book, you specifically mention like the entrepreneurial and leadership mindset. What specifically do you mean by it? And what advice can you give to other entrepreneurs? Yeah, well, I, we draw, if you look at the original model of the two uh, stages, the two clusters, uh, you notice that there's a lot of interesting interactions vertically. Can we go back to that map model, the simpler model that we yeah, first showed? Of the two. Two. But notice this, that um, the if we go at the far end on the right, there's leadership and there's management. And it's very important uh, for, uh, if, for not only having a company with a great leader, but having that leader bring out the best in the set of managers. Uh, and managers often are sources of ideas for, for the leaders. Uh, we don't want a leader who doesn't want to listen to some managers who come up with crazy ideas either. So that interaction is very important. And when I go into a company, I have a sense of whether the leader and the managers are working together. The, uh, uh, the next thing is, um, let's go back to the far left. Uh, um, can we bring some creativity into not only finding an innovation, but vertically in improving productivity? Can we be more creative in imagining new ways to get more output for the same input? So there's an interaction there. Then look at the second level where we have the I, innovation, and we have improvement. A very interesting relationship. Uh, and let me put it this way. If you studied uh, Japan uh, and its development, they relied very heavily on improvement. In fact, they were not that initially innovative. They were all of the uh, culture in Japan in a company. The Every employee was asked, keep thinking of how we can improve how you can improve the job you're doing. And don't worry about getting being so good that you got you said you showed that we don't even need that job. Don't worry because we have lifetime employment. So you can improve your work to such an extent that that job is no longer needed, but don't worry, we'll get another one for you. So the culture was one of in every factory, ideas would just boom. You just go to Centauri. Uh, you just go to um, Toyota, you see that this, there's the factory people are, are full of, I, of improvement ideas. Yet there's an interesting relationship between innovation and improvement. And Japan moved into innovation later on. Uh, the U.S. was more into finding innovations than, than getting building a culture of improving, everyone improving everything they do all the time. So there's a lot of vertical relationships between the two clusters. And, and I've tried to, uh, and, and the real cluster we have to work on is this E vertically down to P. Uh, we hope that, that the, the P people, uh, the professional ones, welcome the entrepreneurial people. What if we've created a conflict uh, where the, Crazy ideas that came up in by from the entrepreneurial uh, people uh, will change my job and make it harder to be as successful as I was before. I can have some problems with the entrepreneurs as a professional marketer. 
and I don't uh, like some of their ideas either. So back in there's a so you have to manage not only the horizontal flow of entrepreneurship and and then of, of good performance, but the vertical interactions shown by those vertical uh, arrows. So uh, let's actually stick to this basic model for a while, because you mentioned already creativity is really important in companies and there is a lot of creativity happening. And I know that in your book, there's a few formulas you use. So um, how would you say, how can entrepreneurs measure the productivity of creativity within their companies? Yes, you know, we began to believe um, in writing this book that marketers are not finance people, but need to be finance people too. At least the entrepreneurial marketers should know finance. Uh, and we have uh, a chapter that actually teaches the whole of finance, the important part, in one chapter. And it's a chapter, it's, it, it's full of... Uh, from the balance sheet to the to market value, that's chapter thirteen, and and it goes into all the ratios, the financial ratios, the the asset turnover, the equity and liability, uh, operating income, understanding cash flow and market value. So we are saying this. While it's hard to get all the professional marketers to be very much into finance you hope by the way both both groups would every marketer should know some basic finance because that's how marketing is going to be judged but the truth is there's so much to learn and we want at least the entrepreneur you know the entrepreneurs are going to be bringing in new ideas and the first question is what is it going to do to our balance sheet and our income statement and and our and our cash flow and our market value. Now we better recognize that that's what top management is going to ask of any innovation that they're going to give support to. So a large part of this uh, is about um, know, knowing finance. Now, if I may use that, uh, uh, Julia, uh, to get to this marketing and finance conflict a little more, I want to tell the story that where this was done so successfully, and it's a real one. It has to do with uh, what is called uh, a MasterCard. You know, uh, there are two big credit cards. Uh, there's a Visa and MasterCard. And the person uh, heading MasterCard uh, in this position of marketing, the CMO, the chief marketing officer, is uh, Raja uh, from India. And um, and Raja has been um, very much into the whole idea of these new marketing uh, developments, uh, things like um, using AI, uh, using um, uh, 3D printing, all kinds of things, and just issuing more and more types of credit cards, specialized in special purpose people, uh, credit cards for disabled people, credit cards for uh, uh, people who are uh, widowed and, 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 and need help. It's an amazing thing. So what he did is he went to his finance person and says, let's work together. Let's, uh, uh, what would you regard, will you ac accept this as a good measure of our rate of return on marketing. So he had developed a whole thing that would be a measure. And finance was convinced that they would give more money uh, based on a good return on investment in marketing. And they worked together. And uh, then he went to all of his regional offices around the world and he says, I want each of you to come up with new ideas on how we can improve our performance as marketers so that we can show these ideas to the finance people and it will help me get the money you want to run your region a little better. Well, there's a whole story there that's been written up. It's in the book as well. And it means that 
finally, marketing uh, is working well for, with finance. Now, I might just, as a side note, mention another problem that is not in the uh, picture here, but marketing often has a big problem with the sales force within marketing. When the sales force, you know, marketing was created to make sales people more effective. Marketing was invented to do the brochures, to do the marketing research, to give tools to sales to do better performance. And yet today you go into a company and the salespeople are unhappy with the leadership of marketing. They think that there's marketing sets too high a price on the products to be sold, sets too high a quota that you must meet. And so I worry about working with any company where not only might there be a problem between marketing and finance, but a problem between marketing and sales. Okay. Yeah, that's an obs observation I can definitely share because sometimes departments just don't speak enough with one another. Uh, yes. But it's, uh, like a lot of people in mar marketing, but also in sales uh, can confirm this. And that's something we should definitely work on in the future. And um, you mentioned before that creativity and innovation, there's an interrelationship between the two factors. And what advice can you now give to companies like um, how can they, they ensure they have innovative solutions in place and can constantly drive innovation within companies yes um, I've studied innovation uh, in a lot of companies and um, actually don't we have a slide on that where I can show some examples of companies that are innovative yes uh, and by the way there's not one model but uh, I've worked with these companies on innovative thinking. Uh, let's talk about the big uh, oil companies, Shell. Uh, what they tend to do is uh, top management encourages everyone to have new ideas in Shell oil. And there's a period where they have a meeting where those people who volunteered ideas are given like 20 minutes to, uh, be, in other words, it would be a day long at shelf once a year or maybe twice a year where the management would sit uh, in the audience uh, and they would hear from one person in the company who has a great idea for shell, then another one, each one would talk for 15 minutes and then accept some questions from management, which is sitting in the audience and uh, it, um, it has been so productive as a process to draw the best from your own people without going to McKinsey or some other company to find an idea for you. And uh, Shell allocated $20 million for new rule-breaking ideas. And uh, of the different pitches that have been made by their own people, uh, they ended up with some green light ideas that averaged 100,000 up to 600,000 of added value to the company. Uh, four teams out of 12 received six month funding. Uh, and uh, of Shell's five largest growth initiatives, four started from the meeting where some member, some person working for Shell said something, was questioned about it, and they found out. That's, there was an innovation buried in that idea and they went ahead and did it. Now that's different from Samsung because I love the Samsung model too. <laughs> Samsung, you know, is big in three areas, television uh, and uh, also they have a wonderful system for smart um, phones and also uh, appliances. I, uh, that may be a surprise to people that you can get a, 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 a dishwasher and other appliances from Samsung. Now, what is their model? Their model is this. When, once they in, innovate the next television set, they end up with a group that's, whose purpose it is, is to make a better one than they just launched in the market. Look, they could 
don't give them the leisure of at least selling more of the brand new set that they created. My God, they're already thinking of something that could be even better. And they do that with the smartphone too. And they do that with appliances. So they set up a team to make obsolete the very new thing they just created. And, and, and it works. It works for Samsung. Now, um, co-creation, companies like Harley-Davidson and, and, and Lego, I think the thing that they have is they so enthuse the users of their products that it's not their own staff that gives them the ideas, it's the users. So uh, many people who have a Harley-Davidson motorcycle, first of all, it's their dream to go to Milwaukee and meet the people. If they have a, a something they want to see Harley do with motorcycles next, they would like to go up to Milwaukee and they're welcome to come to Milwaukee and talk to the people who are the ones who would design anything new for the next year. And uh, so, and they get some of their very best ideas from their customers. The customers are <laughs> running the, pro the firm in a sense, or the future of the firm. Same with Lego. Lego uh, welcomes all these crazy new things to do with those bricks and pieces of Lego. And um, they are honored uh, for, for, and, and, and um, they, they welcome, they welcome people to come in Denmark to their headquarters and to uh, share new ideas that they might have that Lego can produce. So that's, uh, so look, ideas can come from Shell. They're coming from the very people working from Shell who've been motivated to get ideas. Uh, at Samsung, the, the ideas are coming from the technical people who just made the new advances in three different areas, and they're busy trying to obsolete those new advances. And uh, then another source is your own customers can be the best source. Let me add one more example of uh, using your customers. If you, in the book, you'll see, we say a lot about Starbucks and Starbucks has a system where it's always asking the people who drink so much coffee there and uh, every day, please, if you have any ideas for us about the pastries that we feature, uh, the new ways to make better coffee, whatever share them with us and and they have um uh, the very fact that they that starbucks ended up on the shelves of grocery stores uh because normally it was just a place you went for coffee what well, came from one of the uh, customers who said you know i i wish i didn't have to, i i don't always want to go to to, to to your coffee house i want to buy starbucks coffee in the supermarket so there you go um, many uh, company, a company should have a good way to describe how we expect innovative ideas to come into our company. Great, thank you so much. And I think, um, especially in Europe, we have a lot of small and medium sized enterprises. And for them, it's good to have these role models in place and the bigger companies with huge innovation departments. But it's equally important for SMEs, I believe. Yes. Um, so before you mentioned uh, how important it is for finance and marketing to speak to one another, and uh, I'd like to uh, go a bit deeper in, and dive a bit deep, deeper into that topic, because uh, in your book, you mentioned the so-called finance marketing loop. And uh, how would you say can this loop be actually used to uh, drive company growth? Do you remember uh, where in the book it was uh, specifically in which chapter about the loop? It was towards, uh, like, I think the last third of the book. Yeah, uh, because we covered so many uh, I know, ideas. You covered that... so many. But um, otherwise, you can just continue uh, where you, um, you know. Yeah, but I, I will. The last. I'll, I'll tell you uh, something that uh, uh, companies listening, both small and medium and large companies, they might find uh, great interest in Chapter 16, called technology and stakeholders because we uh, describe a lot of new tools that have come into marketing that yeah. will increase value. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's, let's keep it okay. simple. Like looking yeah. at the 
company holistically, how would you say, uh, how would you um, organize an approach that can drive company growth? Let's Yes, right. Um, I, all of these uh, things uh, are called, you know, we, we would say, please, company, uh, consider opening up to AI, especially to the new uh, chat, the GPT. Uh, mm -hmm. What I mean by that is there's a, a fantastic uh, new uh, way to get both image, uh, uh, to, let's say you're a copywriter for mm -hmm. a company. You have to write copy. Um, you're going to sit down and hope for an idea on how to express why a person should buy your product. Uh, it, it is possible now to go to a machine uh, called uh, Generative GPT, mm -hmm. and it's a software, and just say, uh, I not only want a, a, a set of new ideas for selling product X, which you described in the, in the prompt, but I also want some imagery developed um, to show that product in, in, in an ad. This idea that we can now compose, use software to compose our copy and our imaging uh, of, and even narratives. It can even be asked to create a narrative for our business or for a particular product in our business that would be exciting. So one of the things is, is uh, the new generative uh, GPT. But we also talk about how to use things like facial recognition in marketing, how to use uh, voice assistants like Siri and Alexa. Uh, in fact, to have uh, something called a chatbot, a chatbot, you know, this com companies, uh, customers may have a lot of questions when they see a new product. Uh, and we could have one person presenting the new product there to answer every question. But how about creating a chat bot, which is, has anticipated all the questions. And I just say to the software, I'm in, let's say Walmart, and there's a setup of a new product that it wants to talk about. And, so, and, and the product is on the table. I want to just put in a question like, uh, how much will, how much money will be saved by by that product if I switch to that product? Any kinds of questions, the chat bot would be uh, able, like being a real person answering in, in carefully uh, good questions. So the book has, is full of uh, brand new ideas of um, chat bots. By the way, don't create a new product without testing it. And the example I like to use very much is of a company that I know that went ahead with an, an idea for a new car. And they built the factory to make the car before they ever tested people as to whether that is a, an interesting new car. They, they built the factory before they had a test that people would buy it. Now the answer is today is you can create on the computer a simulation of the of the product that would come out of that factory. Let's say it's a new car and gather some people who are looking to buy new cars and say, please uh, put this on your head, these uh, the, 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 and these glasses, look through the glasses. You will see yourself able to go to the new car that we designed get into the car and drive it and you'll hear the the sound and the engine and and the speed so how did you feel about that oh i i thought it was fantastic there isn't such a car is there no there isn't but we can make it and if they find out that uh most of the people who had that ex virtual experience this is called virtual uh reality uh and by the way a lot of uh, my new book is going to be on marketing 6.0 which is called immersive marketing immersive it's sort of like uh, the metaverse that there are other realities 
So this virtual reality lets, if a lot of people say, I'm so excited about this new car now that I've experienced it virtually, yes, I can now build a factory and make it. Thank you so much. I think to summarize, um, to, for a company to grow nowadays, you really need to use all of these new technologies. And yeah. in case you need to uh, innovate a lot, like uh, make sure you launch products which you have tested. And again, use innovative technologies, which uh, where you'll tell us more about it in your new book, I think being released in December about marketing 6.0. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Philip Kotler, you mentioned earlier that rigidity is something that happens naturally in companies and that it can even happen in startups, especially once they get more established. Uh, so what can companies specifically do now to avoid this rigidity as well as routines? Yeah, right. Um, you know, we work so hard to get a good cash flow and and sales of our products that uh, it's so the, a complacency settles into a company. Now, the best way to uh, to protect yourself against complacency is to watch what is happening with your competitors. First, are they coming up with some, are they exceeding you in their sales growth and why? Is there, are you losing customers to X or Y or Z? They, and find out why. But that's not enough because there may be new things happening with other companies that are not hurting your company, but you say, oh my God, that's quite an interesting thing that maybe we could bring into our company. Um, so you got to hope that at least your entrepreneurial marketers have the time to see what's happening with the competitors and with uh, brand new non-competitors doing new things for the first time. And then um, the entrepreneur should have a period to, uh, to, to set aside uh, every so often, let's say every quarter of a company's existence uh, to bring the latest new ideas that were looked at, rejected, worked on. It didn't work, but what did work? So that uh, we have at least a watchdog group that summarizes how did we do with our entrepreneurial work yeah because and, the worst thing that might happen yeah. is uh, the entrepreneurial work uh, uh, that was added at some cost uh, did not uh, excite an, enough change in the company and it, it well it has to prove itself yeah, yeah. And sometimes and very often, so uh, company growth is also influenced by the economy overall. And yes. there are different predictions by the International Monetary Fund, how the economy uh, will grow worldwide uh, over the next 10 years, roughly. So there's growing stagnant and declining scenarios. I'm curious, uh, Philip Kotler, what's your opinion on this development and how will it affect us in the US, in Europe, worldwide? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, it's basically guesswork. Yeah, you can't uh, take seriously what the World Bank uh, says will happen uh, or what the United Nations. You know, <clears throat> we're hoping that all, all companies should adopt the same goal, how to make the world a better place for more people. It's so simple, better place for more people. And now the UN, United Nations has the 17 goals, you remember, cleaner water, cleaner air, but there's more tangible, 17 things. Meanwhile, a lot of other companies are following ESG, what's happening to the economy, the, social, the, the society, and then the G is governance. And they want to be ESG companies, you know. Uh, I, I like the idea that occasionally um, different companies will say we have to make a new move, move toward a better management uh, for all of us. For example, you, there was always companies in management 1.0 always said my only job is to make money. And then along comes a whole bunch of uh, big companies saying, you know, that's not enough. 
uh, we have to, uh, because that is making money for one group called investors uh, and, treat, and, and treating one group well called customers. But isn't business more about our employees, our distributors, our, our um, everyone who makes the company successful? And can we not move from being a shareholder driven to stakeholder driven? So that was a very big advance in to management 2.0 to become stakeholder, uh, share, uh, stakeholder uh, organized. But you know what another big change was in management thinking? To say that we have some social responsibilities. And, and, and it's done in two ways. Some of the companies think of that as we will not do much harm. Uh, if we dig a hole, uh, we'll fill the hole afterwards uh, and not leave a mess. Uh, in, our, in other words, uh, sooner or later, we're going to be charged for the harm we're doing to the environment in one way or another. So we better do less harm to the environment. But that's the negative view. The positive view is, can you as a company uh, take a cause that's important to you and to the world and uh, show that you care about the ocean and its quality of water, which is really being hurt by pollution and so on. So that would be moving. In other words, we're expecting management itself as a philosophy to go through different stages of development. And the latest being uh, this kind of concern about the impact of business on the environment and on and on nature. We have exploited nature and hurt it in the process. Now this whole idea, and it maybe it relates to your your firm too, because you talk about circular. Mm -hmm. The fact is the, the new idea for all the companies that are listening to us now, you must make sure that uh, circularity is practiced, which is really another word for sustainability, but where you minimize waste and you re-find, you reuse, you rediscover, you reuse all your resources. There should be, you, we have had too much pile up of mountains made of stuff we threw away where is the idea of reusing resources again and again and again? And it's coming into focus now. So management uh, ideas are uh, going to grow, continue to uh, grow. And we want the entrepreneurial marketers to be maybe our source that covers the and researches the landscape to find out these new things. Thank you very much. Um... Yes, I actually uh, do see marketing from a very um, sustainable, holistic approach and um, do believe that uh, we really need to think through the whole journey of customers from start to end and uh, totally agree on what you've said. And I mentioned earlier that uh, not only myself, but also a lot of other viewers today uh, do have their own small businesses or are just about to set up their startup. So yes. since you are uh, the most uh, well-known marketer uh, worldwide, uh, what final advice can you give to these small companies uh, for the years to come in terms of their marketing approach? Yes, and I have great respect for smaller uh, S and M, small and medium sized companies, because they're the life lifeblood of a lot of economies, and uh, and they don't have the resources of all the big ones. Um, when it comes to the, my field of marketing. Uh, I normally, whether the audience is large companies or medium and small companies, will say about the same things uh, that make up good marketing. But, you know, I've wanted someone to come along and write a book on marketing for small and medium sized businesses that somehow have additional uh, realities covered that may not be in the general talk we give to large companies about marketing. Um, look, a, a small or medium-sized company still needs 
a leader in the marketing area, which we generally call the, the CMO, a chief marketing officer. Now that, by the way, it, the company is often a, a startup, which really means that it hopes someone in that small group that make up the innovative group uh, is going to be knowing as much as possible about the potential customers that you are making something new for. Uh, and 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 it may not be uh, the kind of deep, deep marketing we get, we get out of marketing research studies and so on. It's m marketing caught on the goal uh, by just by observation. You know, most good insights about how a set of customers behave is done by m managing by walking around. It's it's well known that book called uh, that came out many years ago on uh, on, on excellence. I, uh, but the thing is, uh, live with your customers, become your customers in your thinking as a startup. Or how many small businesses really know their customers well? Um, it, it's possible that the salesmen know certain customers, but um why not be why not choose a set of customers uh, to uh, attend your meeting your board meeting uh and talk of, as customers to your board if you have a board uh, have ask uh, a set of customers what they like about us and what they don't like about us by the way uh, a big company like IBM does that too it uh, has in its big meeting some of its biggest customers complaining about them. It wants complaints from their biggest customers. And it also wants complaints from its their biggest managers who are the big managers in different regions. It is, is, uh, is headquarters doing giving you what you need, really. So the same principles apply to uh, however small you are. Just manage by walking around and continually learn. Thank you so much. And actually, we now have a few minutes left uh, to answer any questions uh, that your viewers have right now. And uh, the last topic you talked about customers, I, I would actually like to lead that over uh, to one question uh, we received earlier when you talked about the Omni House model. Uh, so one viewer is asking, uh, he or she thought that the fifth C customer should be in the center position. So how does yes. it relate to the uh, to the Omni House model? You know that's very uh, the, the book um, uh, just assumes that this is a customer driven company uh, that's reading the book, and that um, the customers uh, are tracked very carefully. You know uh, there used to be a time where companies only looked at their total sales and not as uh, and not the customers as individuals then they started to look at the what they call market segments and they wanted to study what each market segment feels about the business now we are in an age where we are collecting data from individual customers um there's so much uh, we can get to know about individuals from the social media from um special studies uh done that the whole nature of marketing now is is to design actually individual marketing plan plans now that sounds strange but what what should we want customer x to see about our product as opposed to customer Y, who doesn't have to see that, but should see something else. And yet there should be consistency between what X and Y have seen in judging us as a company. So we're moving very much with modern marketing into um, uh, able to test many, 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 many plans. Let's stop that. Many different plans that... Uh, Forming marketing plans now is not just a plan. It's it's really a lot of plans for different groups that we are working with and, and, and so on. 
And um, thank you so much. So you mentioned uh, before that there should be a book written about marketing for small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, what would you say, how can solopreneurs, so people who are just the only person within the company relate to uh, the book Entrepreneurial Marketing? Um, yes, a, a startup basically will find that we have said a, a lot of things about um about how their company will will need need to be managed as it gets off the ground. Um, that omni house model is going to ask that startup firm, what are you going to do about marketing and finance and its relationship? What are you going to do about how technology that you're using now and trying to introduce? How would that affect humanity eventually? Um, and down to individual customers, what kinds of customers will care about that technology? Uh, and which, how many, what kinds of customers will be hostile to the idea of that kind of technology? So again, uh, the book is really presenting for the first time a in-depth picture of so much that goes on whether you're a startup or whether you're a smaller business firm or a huge company uh, about making sure you are achieving um, a place in the market you're going after using the idea of the, uh, as you saw in that model, uh, PDB, um, which is, is to be positioned well, and uh, the D is to be differentiated, and the B is to be branded well. Much is made of branding today. Um, <clears throat> um, a startup needs to think about branding. Else, that's the whole question of how they get any attention. And every company that's well-established has to re review its brand, make sure it's working. Brands have to be reinvented sometimes, re-energized. And um, many brands that grow stale. So we talk a lot about that too. Great. Um, and thank you for emphasizing the importance of branding, both for bigger and for very small, <laughs> same as yes. Oh, yes. And companies, yeah, that was very insightful. Uh, so, Philip Kotler, we've reached the end of our interview today. Uh, I just want to thank you a lot for your time and valuable insights. Uh, also, as I read in the chat right now, uh, the viewers really enjoyed this live interview session today, will, which will be available on YouTube as well. Um, yeah. So, thank you very much, and I uh, hope to see you very soon again. Yeah, Julia, it was a pleasure working with you, and um, I uh, thought the questions and the uh, the slides were wonderfully chosen by you. And um, I know yourself, uh, you're a major person in, in the area for, of helping other companies do well, too. So good luck, too. Thank you so we'll, much. We'll stay, in, we'll stay in touch. I Thank hope you. so. Thank you. Have a good evening or have a good <laughs> afternoon in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank Take you. care. I'll leave now <laughs> and say goodbye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you.